Hello, everyone. I wanted to welcome you all to our webinar today with Varsity Tutors. Um, my name is Doreen Fazen, and I am the director of all of our learning differences and special education programs with Varsity Tutors. Um, this is a, an area that's very near and dear to my heart, as I have a 20-year-old son with autism, as well as a 16-year-old daughter with dyslexia. Um, as the person who oversees these projects and these, these programs, um, I asked Michelle to come out here today from the Asperger Autism Network because in addition to providing one-on-one -on -one tutoring services and our small group special education classes, we just want to be able to provide resources for all of you in general. And um, we are partnering with Asperger Autism Network because they can provide a lot of things that we can't. We can provide academic support, but they have so many other programs that I think would be so beneficial to parents. So I wanted to have Michelle come out here. So with that, Michelle, how about I have you introduce yourself and take over from okay. here? Well, uh, thank you, Doreen. I'm really pleased to be with you here tonight. And um, before we move forward from this slide, I just want to um, sort of deal with some common questions that are gonna be asked. First, yes, there are copies of the slides. Um, and I believe, um, Doreen, you're either gonna post how to download them in the chat or you're gonna email them to people later. I'm, I'm gonna figure that out. I thought I could share through the chat, but I was struggling with that. Okay. So I'm gonna be working on that while you're talking today. But you will be getting the slide. So don't take furious notes. If you have questions, just write down the slide number um, and we can go back to that and you'll get the slide to later. The other thing is we will be taking questions at the end and possibly at various points throughout the presentation, but you might have questions later on. So to avoid email tag, uh, click the click to connect with me link on this title slide. So when you get the PDF, that's a clickable link. Or if that doesn't work, you can send me email, but we might play a little bit of email tag. So let me talk about me just a little bit here so that you know who I am and where I'm coming from. Why is this not working? Okay much better. So my name is Michelle Quintera, and I work for an organization called the Asperger Autism Network. It is um, headquartered in the Boston area, uh, but it is actually a national company or organization. It's a nonprofit organization. We work with people um, throughout the country, and we also work with individuals in other countries as well, although that's not a primary focus. I have been at AANE, which is what we call it for short, uh, since the beginning of 2017. And my role at AANE is I'm the co-director of adult services. I share that role with a colleague, Nancy Schwartz. And together uh, we provide programs and services for adults with Asperger's and autism and for the parents and the families of those adults. And um, family in this context could mean grandparents, adult siblings, um, nieces, in some cases, cousins, aunts and uncles. It can even include close friends. And over the past four years that I've been at a and &E, I've probably talked to several thousand um, individuals and families. And I like having those two perspectives because a lot of what we end up doing in a &E is helping parents um, with the family dynamic. It can be very challenging to be a parent of um, a child, a teen or an adult with autism. And having this dual perspective, I think, helps me provide better advice and suggestions to those families and to the individuals themselves. We also work with the professionals who support those adults in my department, um, the adult services department. Now, I haven't always been at a and &E. um, Before a and &E, I spent 35 years in the high tech industry. And for a lot of that um, stint, I was a consultant uh, doing a lot of advisory services. In the latter part of my career, I was doing organizational change and um, sort of business transformation kinds of services consulting. And that actually relates a lot to what I'm doing now because it's all about what's in it for you and why do you need to change? I spent a great deal of time talking to various companies around the world about that. 
And it's a similar discussion now with, with parents and adults. What needs to change? Does anything need to change at all? Why should you be motivated? And what's in it for you if you do change? So I find that there are some parallels between the two jobs. But my most important job is being Joe's mom. So this is really an evening where two moms got together, me and Doreen. And um, I'm the mother of a 29-year-old son with Asperger's. He was diagnosed with PDD-NOS, which stands for um, Pervasive Developmental Disorder, not otherwise specified, which was a lo lovely diagnostic label that you got back years ago, um, close to a quarter of a century ago. If you had an autism spectrum disorder, um, it was relatively mild, but you had a language delay. So Joe, fast forward, is now 29. Um, he works part-time in retail. He has an associate's degree in engineering. He's pursuing an aggressive engineering degree at a local university. Um, and Joe is the reason I'm here with you tonight and the reason that we're partnering with Varsity Tutors. Um, Joe told me he wanted to go back to school and he wanted to take this particular program. And we concluded that he would need tutors and he would need tutors that understand, understood how his neurodiverse brain worked. So I Googled college level calculus three, online tutors and up popped varsity tutors. And um, Joe actually has two tutors from varsity tutors. They work one-on-one -on -one with him. One is on the spectrum himself and the other is a parent of a young man on the spectrum. So they get Joe's brain, they get how he works and he's had an effective semester and they've really helped him to believe in himself and to value his in intellect. And for me, that is invaluable. So um, I, I'm a fan. So I'm gonna move forward <laughs> and uh, tell you a little bit about a and &E. So as I said, a and &E is a nonprofit organization and it was started over 25 years ago. Um, it started out focusing mostly in um, greater Boston, Massachusetts and New England. And from the inception, the focus was on people with Asperger's. And back then, Asperger's was a separate diagnostic category from autism. So we were talking about people who would now be said to have autism spectrum disorder level one or mild autism. Um, but these were an underserved uh, population back then, and it's still relatively underserved now. So in the beginning, if you looked at organizations who provided services to people on the spectrum, you would mostly see those services being provided by um, organizations that had funding for autism, uh, for people with intellectual disabilities. If you didn't have an intellectual disability, there were very few services for you. So we continue to focus on kind of a cohort of people who have Asperger's or let's say autism spectrum disorder level one. Um, and we refer to that as kind of high cognitive autism. And so within that cohort, we're focusing on three different kinds of constituents. Adults on the spectrum. So these are people who have gone through the school system, um, they are generally 18 or they could be 22 if they've aged out of the school system. Uh, we generally do not provide direct services to children and teens, although we have one support group for teens that we are piloting and that may change in the future, but right now it's not a major focus. We provide services directly to the family and friends of those adults, but also to the families and um, adult friends of children and teens. Another thing that's really different about us is that families and friends bucket includes services for, part, um, for partners and spouses. So we have some couples coaching. Um, so there aren't a lot of organizations who focus on that. Um, and we find that, that that's really differentiating. 
We also work with the professionals that are supporting the families and friends of individuals on the spectrum, as well as the professionals who are supporting the adults. Uh, we do lots of things. We provide training and education, um, not for you know, academic support and for students, but we work with um, school systems. We work with employers who are looking for training. We provide support groups and social activities for adults and for families. Um, and we provide a lot of information and referral services for people who are looking for resources. I'm a mom and this is what I worry about. And you probably worry about similar things. Okay. So back when Joe was a, a younger child, I was mostly worrying about how he was gonna succeed in school. Um, and over time, as he became older and became a teen, I was worried about, did he have independent living skills? And will he be able to work full time and have a job and support himself? There are a lot, there's a lot of feelings um, bound up in that. And as he got older, one of the things that I worried about was, you know, are we gonna have a good relationship? Because not only did I see the normal teenager uh, parent conflict, there were some interesting twists in that that made it even tougher for me, at least as a parent, uh, when Joe went through his teen years and I was afraid I was gonna lose him and our relationship would be severed. So whether you're dealing with a younger child on the spectrum or you're dealing with an, a teen um, or an adult child, you're probably exhausted. You're trying to do a lot of things for a lot of people. So one of the things I still worry about is how am I going to power past my exhaustion so that I can be the best for everyone? And I think a lot of parents deal with that. But the thing that keeps me awake all the time is what's going to happen to Joe when I'm gone? Um, that's a big concern. And I want to make sure that he has a support network um, that's there for him should he need it. And that's one of the reasons I'm at A&E these days as well. So for you know, the next 40 minutes or so, uh, we're gonna go through these topics. And I think it's a good idea if we all get on the same page in terms of what do we mean by Asperger's and autism. Some of you may be old pros and you could just take the slide deck and you could do this very same presentation. Others of you might, um, be dealing with a situation where your child is newly diagnosed. Some of you may not even have gone through that at all. You really suspect that your kid might um, have Asperger's or autism. So I wanna come up with some common terminology and just understand some of the, the challenges that our kids may be facing. The other thing I wanna do is share one slide with you. There is a metaphor for putting ourselves in our kids' shoes and understanding how it might feel to be on the spectrum. Um, I think understanding what um, they're facing can really be helpful. And I really credit my understanding evolving because I've heard thousands of stories that enriched my perspective. And to some extent, I feel I can appreciate the challenges facing our kids. Then we're gonna go back to those biggest worries because those are the things that keep us up at night. And then I'll give you some ideas of places you can go to help for help. You can get help from A&E, but there are other places you can go as well. And I'll give you some ideas. And then we're gonna end with three things to remember. And um, one of the things that I remember from my high tech career and doing a lot of um, big conference presentations is it's helpful to tell people up front what are the three things they should remember from the presentation because repetition helps. Um, also, should you suddenly lose um, your internet connection because your cat chews through some cable, um, you know, you'll know what the, the key points here. So the three things to remember, the three takeaways are maintain trust and influence with your kid. 
we could have a really lively debate and have a whole nother webinar about whether or not at any point um, in your life as a parent that you have, do you have actual power over your kid to make them do something? Maybe when they're little and when you can sit on them. But as they get older, increasingly it shifts from power to influence. And definitely by the time they're an adult, all you've got is influence. You don't really have any authority or power anymore. And in order to maintain influence, you have to maintain trust. And to, keep, to maintain that trust, the way in which you communicate with your kid, communication style matters, and the degree to which they understand you accept their autism as, and don't require them to behave like a neurotypical person 24 by seven helps in engendering that trust. The other thing is rethink what good looks like. There are some things you may not be able to change. One of those things is you can't cure autism. Autism is an intrinsic part of your kid. So one of the suggestions here is to reframe what you can't change. One of the things that I learned, um, and it took about 10 years to learn it, is that Joe's autism is something I treasure. I once had a conversation with him where I told him, I would take the autism out of you to make your life easier because I would have to put it back into you because you would not be you if you were neurotypical. You wouldn't be the person I treasure. You wouldn't be the funny, honest, noble, kind, um, lovely young man that you are. I treasure you because you have Asperger's. It's not, you know, I don't love you despite it. I love you with it. Um, and the last thing is give yourself a break. Parents try to be heroes and you don't have enough energy all the time to be heroes. So give yourself a break. You're doing the best you can do. Let's talk about what we mean by Asperger's and autism. We talk about the autism spectrum all the time. It's an umbrella term, it's kind of ubiquitous. But when we use this term, we tend to use it like we're talking about a gradient. We're going from mild autism or high functioning autism to low functioning, which is a terrible set of words actually. But that suggests that there is a set of symptoms that collectively worsen or lessen as you move up or down the spectrum. Autism doesn't work that way. It's not a linear function. Um, what you see below this picture of a light spectrum is a bunch of attributes. So there are seven columns of attributes. And these attributes come from the diagnostic criteria uh, that um, physicians use to diagnose people with autism. And the things outlined in red are the really important core diagnostic attributes or categories. And the point to this picture is to say, people are going to have challenges in each of these areas. They might have bigger challenges or smaller challenges in some of the areas, but it's mixed up in such a way that you're not gonna see a nice clean distinction between uh, mild to severe autism. You're going to see manifestations of these different attributes in different ways. So what does pragmatic language mean? Pragmatic language in this context means social communication. It means having a conversation, your body language, these gestures, eye contact, um, the ability to make small talk, to take turns in a conversation. So I believe I was able to get my son diagnosed at around four years old, uh, because I said to Joe's primary care physician at one point, okay, my kid is three and a half and he has perfect grammar and a vocabulary of thousands of words. We are not having a back and forth conversation about things that matter. When I worked with preschool deaf kids, which I did in um, college, we shared a vocabulary of 10 words and my signing was not fabulous, but we had rich conversations. 
and uh, there was a lot of back and forth engagement. So that's, I think, what made my primary care physician sit up and take notice and send us to a bunch of specialists. Now, social awareness is things like, um, do you know you're in a formal setting or an informal setting? Are you using the right speech patterns and tones and phrases for that setting? Are you able to engage with other people and actually form friendships? So what you'll often hear with um, younger kids is I'm not seeing any real play. I'm seeing parallel play. You know, the kids are with each other, but they're not engaging. They're playing side by side. Monotropic mindset. Um, this essentially has to do with your child's special interest. Um, is your kid obsessed with planes and trains and whales or sports or whatever? And is that all they want to talk about? Is it almost obsessive? And are they also very inflexible? And is it difficult to get them to change in one way or another? I know of a family um, in the Boston area who has a lovely son who has a lot of eating issues. Part of those eating issues might be related to sensory processing, but part of them are related to inflexibility. This man will only eat cheese pizza from a certain pizza parlor in the Boston area. And the parents are like, what should I do about this? And I'm thinking, this has been going on for about 10 years. And that might be one of those things you can't change. So they were buying a bunch of pizzas a week and freezing him. And this is what the kid eats every day. And I said, well, I don't think I have a great solution for this, but you might think about buying the pizza parlor so it doesn't go out of business because then you'll have a problem. Um, I'm going to move to repetitive behaviors. Those are things like stimming. They can be things that help you relax could be rocking, it could be a certain amount of hand flapping, it could be pacing, but it could also be things like um, video game addiction. So we see that in older kids and adults. Um, and, and that is really a stimming exercise for a lot of people. Um, these other things, information processing, sensory processing and neuromotor differences aren't in red. I think that's a shame because I think that information processing and sensory processing should be part of the core diagnostic criteria, but I'm not a physician and nobody asked me. But information processing means in this situation, it's hard for you to take in and assimilate new information. Um, if you look at people's neuropsych results, generally what you will see, you'll see a phrase that says, slow information processing speed. So it's harder to take things in auditorily. It may be harder for, for people to take things in in terms of reading. So this can make it hard for them to adapt to new environments. It certainly makes it hard to learn. Sensory processing is think about um, the way in which you perceive the five senses. And there's actually more than five senses, but, um, but just think about if you are undersensitive or oversensitive to the environment your life would be a little difficult. You'd be bombarded, let's say, with lights and sounds and taste, or maybe you wouldn't be that sensitive and you would do something like my friend's child once did and eat the top of a cactus because this was a kid who just didn't get a lot of sensory input and in that point didn't feel pain. Neuromotor differences, um, the classic thing here would be the uh, clumsy professor type who doesn't know where his body is in space and trips over things. But in reality, this could mean your kid might not know how to make their bed. They just don't know what the motor activities are to make a bed and that may be really difficult for them. Um, so the whole point here is that people have different combinations of challenges in each of those seven areas. So what happens, we're not talking about a nice high to low spectrum or gradient. We're talking about people who are very, very unique in the way Asperger's and autism manifests in them. It's like snowflakes. 
you know, and what that means is there is no wonderful one size fits all technique or intervention to help. And that makes life hard. So the whole set of language around um, Asperger's and autism is a little bit tricky because there's been some changes over time in diagnostic terms. So to make a very, very long story short, before 2018, um, Asperger's and autism were two separate things, distinct diagnoses. Um, in 2018, they were glommed together. So Asperger's is now officially gone. It is no longer a separate term. The symptoms, the thing that used to be Asperger's is now kind of folded into autism and it's called autism spectrum disorder level one. That means you, um, level one means you are on the spectrum, but you need mild support to be able to succeed, live independently um, and to just go about your daily business. Because the term Asperger's went away, because so many people used to be diagnosed with it and they liked that term, a lot of people are still using it even though it's not an official diagnostic term. People who are diagnosed after 2018 are kind of used to the term autism, which is why um, we use the, the Asperger slash autism kind of moniker because we can't really force people to use one or the other people identified with both. So I hope that makes sense. So what are the challenges facing our kid? Um, so this picture that I'm about to show you is actually a metaphor for thinking about what's going on in that spectrum picture I um, showed a couple slides back. So in A&E's perspective and other people's as well, um, one of the fundamental challenges that a person with Asperger's autism has is self-regulation. And there's three pieces to this, um, three kinds of things to regulate. One is sensory input, and that is you're getting too much input. Maybe fluorescent lights are just flooding you with input and you can't handle it. Or loud noises um, like fire alarms cause your kid to want to never go back to school. Um, food textures are another thing that are a big deal. My kid to this day doesn't like like peas anywhere near the mashed potatoes because he doesn't like the mix of textures. Emotions and anxieties are a big issue. Um, I, in fact, I don't think I've ever met an individual in the spectrum that didn't have a fair amount of anxiety. Whether that anxiety comes from being flooded with too much or too little sensory input or concerns about um, doing things incorrectly socially or in terms of executive functioning, I don't know the root cause, but anxiety is a major thing. And anxiety can lead to depression and there's a whole lot of emotion tangled up in that. So a lot of times when people come to us, they will have autism as a diagnosis, but they've got a string of other things as well. A lot of times people will be labeled as um, bipolar. So I, we see a lot of that. The other thing is attention and impulse control. So is the impulse control a regulation, a regular, excuse me, a self-regulation issue, or is it because you don't understand social interactions or is it a bit of both? Not clear, but most of the younger kids that I see are diagnosed with ADHD first, because what's most obvious is the attentional regulation issue. And later on, um, they may get an autism diagnosis. And that's kind of how my kid started out. So think about what life would be like if you had to balance on a ball with these three things in it, and those three things were moving all the time, and changing your center of gravity and balance. And then someone started throwing balls at you and said, social interactions, juggle this. I want you to be able to make friends, be a scintillating conversationalist. Um, maybe at work, you know, you need to get along with your coworkers. Um, you need to be able to make friends and, and you know, be nice to your grandmother. 
those are all social interactions that could be difficult. With executive functioning, you throw in another ball at your kid and there you're saying, do your homework, write your resume, um, clean your room. If you're at work, you know, um, you pack, um, load this truck in this way. It could be anything. But the point is those are complex tasks. And if you don't have good executive functioning skills, that could be a huge challenge. I'm gonna skip to theory of mind. Theory of mind means you have an idea about what it's like to be someone else and you can put yourself in their shoes and infer what they're feeling. Um, inference is usually not something that someone on the spectrum is good at. It's usually an area that's a challenge. Um, and what you often hear is that people on the spectrum aren't empathetic because they don't anticipate how other people are feeling. And that's kind of unfair because it's just an area that it's hard for them to put themselves in other people's shoes. So if, um, and I have said this, you know, Joe, I'm not your maid. The fact that you leave all of this stuff to me makes me feel like you don't love me. And Joe's sitting there going, oh, I didn't do all that because I was overwhelmed by everything else. It's not that I hate her or anything. Um, so that might be something you see. Central coherence is a real tricky thing. That's the tendency to see the details and not the big picture. In other words, you see a bunch of trees, you don't get that it's a forest. And what that does is it makes it hard for our kids to generalize from one situation to another. So um, if you were to sit down with your kid and say, why can't you send this bill? You, and you didn't put your return address on it. I showed you how to do that with your grandmother's thank you note. Well, those are completely two different, completely two different activities for your kid. And the fact that there's something called a return address in the same position on one envelope and the other envelope doesn't necessarily seem like the same thing to him. It's not necessarily part of a big concept. So learning can be harder. The point of this, if your kid is doing this balancing and juggling act 24 by seven, he's trying to be neurotypical when he's not in a neurotypical world. So the rest of us do this pretty automatically. It's almost like breathing. However, if you have to spend actual cognitive energy thinking about doing this, it's gonna be exhausting. So think about that. You're actually asking your kid to do something that isn't automatic. Um, and when I created this kind of metaphor and I showed it to Joe, he gave me a, a hug and he said, this is it, this is my life. So I think it's sort of, it sort of does the job. So talk about worry, because we're all parents and by definition, we worry. So let's start out in the beginning. As I said, Joe was um, diagnosed at about four, although at around three, he went to preschool because they said, yeah, there's something going on even though we don't know what's going on. And I had a lot of feelings back then, mostly of guilt. So when you find out there's something going on with your kid, the first thing you feel is, what did I do when I was pregnant? Where did I go? What did I eat? What did I drink? What did I do or not do? It must have been something I did. It took me a while to get over that. The other um, concern was, well, I didn't figure this out soon enough and get him help soon enough. And I've heard that so many times. And you you need to you need to let go of that because you're doing the best you can. Fear is a big thing because I didn't know what autism meant. I thought my kid suddenly might stop talking to me. He might stop relating to me at all. And since he was the center of my world, I couldn't handle that when he was little. And I was terrified of that. Um, I got over that after a while. Then there was the fear of not taking advantage of all the opportunities that you should. And then there's simply grief. And I, I think I need to be honest about that. You grieve because 
oh, I had this kid, but now they're telling me he has a disability. Therefore, my kid is not perfect. And you grieve for that until you get to the point where you realize, no, that's just the way it is. And it's okay. And you learn to treasure and value the autism as opposed to thinking of it as a disability. I will admit that can take a decade, but you can get there. Um, but grieving is a process you need to let yourself do because you need to come to terms and understand what this means for you and your kid. So what are some of the common concerns that we were dealing with? Um, in the beginning, I was really worried that I was getting the right testing and assessments to figure out what services Joe needed. To be honest, his primary care physician was not all that helpful. The people who helped me were other parents, specifically moms, moms from hell. The mothers from hell that were part of my local special education parent advisory council, kind of like a PTO for, um, parents of special needs children. They were the ones who took me aside and said, no, no, this is how the process works. This is how the special education system works. These are the kind of tests you um, need. And these are the kind of people you go to. Those people they sent me to are still part of Joe's support network today. Part of the reason I'm at a and &E is because I owe those parents. I need to pay it forward um, at this point in my life when I can to help other parents find these supports and understand these processes. Uh, navigating the special education system, such a delightful activity. There are educational consultants that you can get. Um, in Massachusetts, we do something called an IEP review. Um, it's only for Massachusetts, so it doesn't work in other states because IEP reviews are a little different in each state. Um, but each state generally has a number of organizations who provide training on how parents can go through the special education system. One of them in Massachusetts is the Federation for Children with Special Needs, but every state has something like that. And another great place to go is the ARC. If you look up ARC and disability, you're gonna see a ton of disability um, related services around special education. And a lot of it's geared towards parents and it's gonna be really helpful. Another thing that was really tough for us was integrating um, all of the behavior strategies and the learning strategies across all the environments where Joe was at school, in daycare and at home. I didn't have a lot of help with this. Here I turned to my high tech background and program management um, background because I know how to get everybody on the same page and move forward. Um, now, I'm so glad I'm not a parent right now because I can't imagine what it's like to deal with the pandemic to have taken your kid on the spectrum who probably isn't that amenable to change, shifting him or her to remote learning, and now suddenly getting ready to shift them back. Um, some kids have thrived on remote learning and some kids have totally hated it. But in any event, um, I would say the change is really difficult. But what got me through this mostly was other parents showing me the way. Here's another story. Um, Sarah is, um, at the time this story started, she was 19. And she had not been diagnosed with autism. Um, she was a quiet, introverted kid, did okay in school, didn't make waves. Like many women on the spectrum, she was kind of unnoticed because she didn't look like she had massive ADHD and um, she, she wasn't loud or obviously socially inappropriate. She was just really introverted. And she lived in a family where um, her mom did a lot for her because her mom wanted her mostly to focus on succeeding at school. So her mom did a lot of things that you would say are life skills. Um, and her mom provided a lot of structure for Sarah. And you know, along the way that created some conflict with Sarah because she wanted to be independent. So she was very happy to go away to college and go to nursing school. 
So partway through the first semester, things started to unravel because she couldn't balance the academics and all of the life skills she had to do on her own, especially without the structure and let's say the prodding and prompting from her mom. Um, she ended up kind of having a meltdown and we hear this story a lot the first couple years of college can be very tricky because a kid is trying to learn to live independently and grapple with some of the learning um, challenges of autism at the same time. She ended up coming back home and living at home and kind of the whole college situation did prompt her and her family to seek some help and as a result she was diagnosed with let's say Asperger's autism. And that led her to be really depressed um, and anxious. I think she was coping with what does this mean for me? Um, I have a disability. I don't want to admit that. I don't want to deal with people. There was a lot going on with her and she was pretty depressed. And all she was doing is playing video games and sleeping really late, which caused her parents to be extremely concerned. There was a lot of conflict between them. And finally, the mom decided she's got to move out. She has to be independent. I know she can't live on her own. And um, the mom came to us and we worked with them to kind of find a group home situation that was appropriate for her and her interests and to seek out, you know, some uh, public benefits to make that financially easier and um, to actually help and get her a part-time job. And she lived in that situation for a number of years, but then she kind of turned her part-time job into a full-time job. She's moved out of that group home and now she's living with her boyfriend in an unsubsidized apartment and they're pretty happy. Is life perfect? No, but I think that's a good example of parents stepping back and saying, yeah, we've got to come up with some kind of interim solution to give her some help to be independent because it's not gonna be helpful to us if we all live together. Getting a job. Well, getting a job is one problem. I actually find that that's easier than keeping the job. Um, although a lot of our kids don't interview well because they don't necessarily look all that wonderful sometimes because hygiene um, and appearance can be a real challenge. Like, have you shaved this week? How many times have you showered? I, I hear that a lot, <laughs> okay? So I wanna share a couple of stories with you. And I'm gonna start with Ethan. Um, Ethan was about 17-ish when this story happened. And, um, Ethan had a long list of diagnosis, um, not autism at this point in time. He had a nonverbal learning disability diagnosis. It's now been amended to be autism. But back then it was a nonverbal learning disability diagnosis, which is very closely related. And he was looking for a summer job. And he went to a local deli, very nice deli, kind of a country storage thing. And Ethan got the job because they were looking for people. And then a week later, he was fired and he was despondent. Well, he was fired because his information processing um, skills were not that high. He, it'd be really challenging for him to take in some of a verbal order from someone who wanted a custom sandwich and remember that. And it would be even more challenging for him given his motor skills, which were a little clumsy and slow to put it together. Um, and his executive functioning skills were not the best either. So the moral to this story is, see if you can get your kids to be realistic about what their skills are. You know, Ethan isn't going to be good at making custom deli sandwiches. He wouldn't be a good barista 
probably either at Starbucks. Those are things that um, speak to his challenges rather than his strengths. So sit down and do maybe an informal assessment with your kid or go to places like Easter Seals or vocational services um, in your region, they can help you do those assessments as well. Uh, or, um, you know, when we do our life map one-on-one -on -one coaching program, we do assessments as well to start to get at where are people's strengths, where are people's challenges and what kind of work environments and positions would be good for them. Um, I'm gonna move over to Tom next. Uh, Tom is about 20, I think. And he works for a delivery service and he had worked for another organization doing something not related to delivery for a long time, but he lost his job because of COVID um, and he really needed to find another job. So he, he did get a job in this delivery service organization. Tom has not disclosed, Ethan didn't disclose by the way either. Um, Tom did not disclose to his employer. And Tom is having some difficulties because this employer doesn't really have clear business processes and procedures around um, what you do when you check in from work or what you do when you're assigned a truck and what you need to do to make sure that it's loaded correctly and has all the stuff you need and you're going to the right place and all kinds of things. Things are a little bit loosey goosey. And for him, that is a big challenge. He also is concerned that some of his coworkers are trying to mess him up because they think he's quirky and weird. I don't know if that's true or not, but because there aren't clear cut processes, that's hard for him. So in this situation, Tom is probably going to end up looking for another job because his assumption is this one isn't going to go well, nor does he think the company culture is going to um, really change. Um, he could get a life coach from A&E or somebody else, but the problems still are likely to be the same because they're company culture issues. So the moral to this part, to Tom's story is look at company culture. And there's some articles about company culture that I put in the resource section at the end. Jeremy's story is really interesting. Um, Jeremy is a successful engineer who's been working for 10 or more years. And he actually has felt somewhat liberated by the pandemic because he's been able to work at home which means he only needs to deal with himself and he enjoys his own company. He prefers working remotely, prefers not having to engage with other people because he liked his work. He didn't necessarily love the socialization part of it. Um, and he's, he found that when he was working at home, he could be more himself. He didn't have to act neurotypical and he didn't have to do the balancing juggling act 24 by seven. Because he's been an engineer for so long, he's got a little nest egg. Um, and he has decided to drop out of the workforce for a while. And he's laying low, he's pursuing some passions in art, and he's not clear about whether he's going to back to work as an engineer or anything else. Um, I have not spoken with his parents, but I know if I were them, I'd be a little flipped out by this, but Jeremy seems happy. Um, and for those of you who are parents of kids who are working and are now working remotely, you might see that some of them really prefer this and they're not going to want to transition back to in-person work. I'm, I'm seeing a big trend in that area um, and that might be something you have to deal with. Cindy's story um, is really interesting. So Cindy's story to me um, illustrates kind of the trade-offs you have to make between using a tough love approach versus gentle pressure. So you know, your grandparents, um, friends, people who don't have kids on the spectrum might be saying, 
your kid is being lazy, your kid is being a jerk, just tell them to get it together, get a job and move out. But they have a point. It is possible your kid is lazy and is being a jerk. I have seen that happen. However, I've seen other things be the root cause of shutdown and not being able to move forward at all. And Cindy's story is a good example of that. So Cindy's, I, I've never met Cindy. I talked with Cindy's parents and they told me they have two children. Cindy is the oldest and she had a younger brother, has a younger brother who has very severe autism. He is nonverbal, um, has a lot of behavior issues and he is in a residential placement. They see him frequently, but he's in a residential placement. Um, whereas Cindy was diagnosed with Asperger's and was successful in school for the most part. And as they put it, she's intact cognitively. So we expect that she's going to be able to live independently and be okay on her own. But they were worried because like a lot of other kids, she had crashed and burned in college and she was at home now, hanging out, playing video games and not going anywhere. This is pre-pandemic by the way. And they said, we think she's lazy and we've given her an ultimatum to either get a job and pay us um, some kind of modest rent, go back to school and get a degree, but or just move out completely. And I'm like, okay, do you think she's capable of that? And the interest, we had an interesting conversation about, well, she needs to be capable of that. And I said, let's back into why is she so tired and depressed? Why is she just sitting around all day? And you know, we went through, was she excessively anxious? What's going on? Well, finally they said, she doesn't really eat. She's really thin. I'm like, well, is she bulimic? Is she anorexic? No, that's not really it. She just doesn't eat a lot. I'm like, well, does she like food? Yeah, she seems to. And what I did find is she had a lot of sensory issues. She's very picky about textures and smell and from other things they told me. And I said, so what happens if she does go to work, because she did have some part-time jobs for short periods of time, does she bring lunch? Yeah, but she doesn't eat it. Why not? Because by the time she, she might have liked the idea of whatever it was she made in the morning, but by lunchtime, the whole idea turns her off. You know, there's just something about the food and the way she experiences it that just grosses her out and she won't eat. And I said, hmm. I think there's something going on here. And this big triangle is Mav Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And my comment to them was, let's make sure you're, that she can deal with her basic needs first and she can eat. Make sure once she's eating, you know, once that's under control, then you can think about the tough love ultimatum and moving out. But I'm worried that this kid isn't eating. And perhaps it's a sensory integration issue that is causing her to not like food, which is causing her not to eat. So for that, we ended up suggesting that she see an occupational therapist who specialized in sensory integration issues and having that occupational therapist recommend a nutritionist that she could work with. Um, it turned out in this situation, our theory was correct. And I don't really know where Cindy went from there, but I did hear from the parents that it, it made a big deal. Um, it was a big change for them. So they were focused on, you know, on fixing the eating issues. And later on, they were gonna go back to the, you need to move out and, and live independently. So I thought this was a good example. How do you power past your exhaustion? You know, I mean, we're parents, we're exhausted because we're trying to be superheroes, which we can't be. So pretend you're on a plane and you're listening to the pre-flight takeoff recording. What does it say? It says in some kind of emergency, the oxygen masks are gonna come down. Put yours on first, because if you run out of oxygen, there's no way you're gonna help anybody else in your family. Help yourself first. Be realistic and give yourself a break. You have a finite amount of energy. 
use it where it's most important, which gets down to pick your battles. So if I am working with Joe on an objective to actually get up on time for class, I'm not gonna be as picky about whether he eats vanilla ice cream for breakfast. I would prefer that he ate something healthy, but in the scheme of things, that's less critical path than getting up for class or going to work on time. So pick your battles and don't try to make your kid work on too many things at once. If you can't change something, reframe how you think about it. Um, again, I told you about kind of reframing my view of autism as something that's an intrinsic part of Joe that I value, as opposed to thinking about it as a disability. That really helps me. I think it helps Joe. Um, I have been perennially frustrated by the fact that he does not clean his room. He actually lives in um, a basement apartment in our house. It used to be an in-law apartment, but my mom is no longer with us and it's now the man kid. Well, it doesn't get cleaned. And all of my um, diatribes about the Board of Health that's gonna come in here and condemn the place didn't really matter. Finally, I said, I am just gonna charge you an extra 75 bucks a month for rent and the cleaning people are gonna clean this for you. Um, and you're just gonna have to pay for it. He's like, I'm okay with that. And I'm like, okay, maybe I need to reframe this. Having him be okay with paying for something that he's never going to be able to do can be a good thing. The other thing that keeps me going is I connect with a lot of other parents. And even before I worked at a and &E, um, I had a good parent network. My um, best friends are also, well, they're actually Ethan's parents. And we've been through hell and back together, but it's good to be able to talk to them because they understand they've been in my shoes. They understand the fear and the guilt and the grief and the roller coaster feelings. So reach out to other parents. <sighs> Types of stories that really affect me most when I work at a and &E are parents and um, from also the adults who say to me, I have a severed relationship with my parents or family or vice versa. And there's so much pain and anguish in those statements. And a lot of it has to do with some power related conflicts that have been around for a long time. So one of the things that I typically see is that conflicts start because you have different goals. Your kid might say, yeah, I wanna get a job and move out. And those are, and you might think their goals are my goals, we're on the same page. But think about how important are those goals to him and, or her and how important are they to you? So your adult child's goals are really to make you vaporize and go away and stop nagging them and get off their back. It doesn't matter that you're helping them. All they're seeing right now is nagging um, and they want you to go away. Now, they also wanna be less scared, overwhelmed or lonely because they're probably feeling really isolated. They may not have a lot of friends. They may be scared about putting themselves out there because they've been bullied, they've been socially unsuccessful, they're overwhelmed maybe by COVID or the whole prospect of going to school or whatever. Um, so they're kind of in shutdown mode. So they, yeah, they want to find a relationship, but they don't want to find a relationship so much that they want to put themselves out there. So the point is the order of some of these um, goals are different you have different goals than they do, or you have different priorities. So aligning your goals is a key part of establishing and maintaining trust with your kid. Because in my view, your ultimate goal with your kid is to build influence, not power. The power goes away over time because you can't make your adult child do um, anything. You don't have authority anymore. So realize you can't force your adult child to pursue your goals. And I would say by the time your kid is 13, it gets increasingly tough to force them to do anything. So instead, 
make suggestions, plant seeds that motivate your kid to pursue goals. Things like, well, you really wanna do this engineering program and you really wanna live on campus because um, you want to have that campus experience. Well, maybe you need to know how to plan and cook a few meals if you're not going to live on campus, but you're going to live in your own apartment. And you let it go for a while until they figure out, yeah, I got to do this. And they may not do it. And okay, they're going to starve to death that semester. It is sometimes very hard to peel back the emotion as a parent. And what I tell myself when I'm about to go into crazy mom screamer mode is, okay, pretend he's not my kid. Pretend he's a peer coworker because he is a peer, he's an adult. He happens to be my kid who doesn't act like an adult a lot of the time, but he knows he's legally an adult. He expects to be treated like a peer. Okay, take a deep breath, Michelle and pretend he's a peer coworker and try to communicate with him in a style that shows the kind of respect um, and consideration that you would give to a peer coworker. If you treated a peer coworker like they were a direct report and they weren't, they would begin to resent you. And that's the kind of dynamic I saw playing out with me and my kid and I see with a lot of other parents and adults. We talked about the tough love trap um, I don't think we need to go through that again, but it, one of the takeaways here is make sure your kid knows you love them because of their Asperger's and autism, not despite it. That was a big aha uh -huh moment for me. I thought Joe just knew this, but he doesn't have a theory of mind and he can't read my mind. I needed to say this to him. I needed to say, you do realize because you have Asperger's and autism, you're not broken. You don't need to be fixed. You have challenges and you need to discover the best way to deal with those challenges, but you're not broken and you don't need to be fixed. You're not letting me down. I'm not disappointed. I love you the way you are. That was a big aha moment um, in my life, in Joe's life and other parents tell me the same. Two more stories and I'll try to make this um, fairly quick. Um, the first, and this is about parent-child relationships that go wrong and um, where the parent and the child are very far apart. Uh, Bobby's story, again, this is um, a young man, I think he was around 19-ish. And um, I talked to his dad, who was a very high-powered executive, very much a type A personality, lovely man, loved his kid a lot, um, but they were just at loggerheads. And Bobby didn't really have a diagnosis, but his parents strongly suggested, suspected, excuse me, that he was on the spectrum, but Bobby was in denial and didn't wanna go be evaluated for anything. But Bobby was shut down, had um, failed at college, was again doing the video games, sleeping all day, eating pizza, leaving pizza boxes around his room kind of deal. And, um, and maybe getting involved in some online things that were not the greatest. However, at one point, Bobby came to his parents and said, I don't have a lot of friends, but I have this one good friend who lives in another state and I wanna spend the weekend camping with him, but I don't have any money to take a bus to go see him. Would you please lend me the money to do this? And his parents struggled back and forth because everybody else in the family was saying, no, he's being lazy. Um, he's taking advantage of you, make him man up. And um, as the parents, particularly the dad told this story, I could see that there was, he was conveying that Bobby had a real need to connect to another human being. And thinking back to that Maslow hierarchy of need thing, that's one of those intermediate needs, connections and relationships. And I said, you know, you guys are at loggerheads a lot, but if you let him do this, if you help him do this, it might make him trust that you have his best interest in mind, that you see him as a, a fellow human being that has the right to being 
engage with other people and have relationships. And so they did lend him the money. He had a lovely weekend with this friend. Was that, you know, was this a fairy tale and everything turned out perfectly? No, but it did help restore a tiny amount of trust and the relationship between the parents and the kid were a little better. Um, I don't know what's going on with Bobby these days. I haven't kept in touch with them. Jake's story, a little bit similar. Um, Jake also was not diagnosed with autism um, at this point in time. He was 20, perhaps. And um, he was a very anxious person and he self-medicated with weed. And because the parents had a younger daughter, they felt that he was not a good influence and they were in a position to um, get an apartment for him. So they told him he had to leave uh, and they you know, were very generous in, in providing that apartment. And he was also working part-time, a very good part-time worker um, in the food industry. So he was able to earn some money to support his daily needs. The problem was him and his friendships. And he fell in with, let's say, the wrong crowd and people who would take advantage of him and would befriend him because he had a car, he would drive them all over the place and he would give them money. To make a long story short, um, there were some problems. Well, let me get to that. So the dad's view was Jake didn't really deserve to be treated like an adult because he didn't behave like an adult. He didn't act in responsible ways like an adult. He was allowing these people to take advantage of him and so forth. And at the same time, the dad was very sad that he had no contact with his kid and the kid had severed relationships with him because he just felt the dad was being really controlling. And I kind of gave the dad my parenting without power speech. And there's a bunch of webinars uh, links at the end of this presentation, if you want to go see those. But essentially it said, yeah, all right. He, maybe he doesn't act like an adult. I'll give you that. But he knows he is an adult and he expects to be treated like an adult and you'll only drive him farther away. So try this, you know, communicate with him like a peer routine for a while and see if you can regain his trust. And months later, I got an email saying, we went to a football game. He talked to me. It was awesome. And then about six months later, I got another email saying, Jake got into some trouble with these not so great friends. And he turned to me for help. And he's, he appreciates my help. Things are getting better and he's agreed to go be evaluated. So those are stories that had relatively positive outcomes. I'm not saying there are any magic fairy tale solutions here, but these techniques do work and they do improve the relationship between parents and kids. So this is what is currently keeping me awake now. What's gonna happen to Joe when I'm gone? Joe's an only child, I'm an only child. My husband's an only child, we are old, okay? So who's gonna make sure he's okay? that he has a place to go for Christmas or Rosh Hashanah or whatever, that he's got enough money to live on, that he will make good decisions. So one of the things that parents um, of kids with Asperger's and autism struggle with is, do they need a guardian? Generally, the answer is probably not. There are lots of exceptions because most of them are going to be able to make their own decisions but they may not be able to assemble all of the information with which to make the decision. So there's a thing called supported decision-making. There's a link in the back of the presentation about that. And it's an alternative to traditional guardianship. Essentially, you have people who your kid appoints to be advisors to them around, let's say, education or finances, um, employment, health, whatever but it gives them a panel of people to help them with decision-making. They are the, the person with the disability is the ultimate decider. Nobody's taking that right away from them, but your kid is able to give the right to access information on his behalf um, so that they can help provide that advice. 
So I'm hoping that will be something that might work for Joe. I think you have to be realistic and continually reassess. So we've kind of built the plan for what happens when we're gone with a worst case scenario in mind. And I hope we're pleasantly surprised and Joe doesn't need that and those resources can be used for something else. Um, but I look at what life skills does he have now? We wanna keep those going. So he's good at driving. He can, you know, he can hold down a job. I don't know if he can hold one down 40 hours a week, we'll have to see. Will he be able to support himself independently on his earnings alone? Not sure about that, which is why he's going to school and why he's getting a lot of coaching from a and &E to, um, you know, with executive functioning to complete school. And he might need some coaching for other skills along the way. I mean, he's getting tutoring to help him master uh, some of the academics. Some of the things he's never going to do, and he's going to have to get those from service providers. We've already identified one of those things he's never going to do. He is never going to clean his apartment. And we will always need to think about, will there be a modest amount of money to pay for cleaning service? So don't put off estate planning, even if you don't have a much of a, an estate to plan with. Because part of that might mean that you have your kid apply for public benefit programs. And just because you're doing that doesn't mean you've given up on them. That is kind of a way, it gives you and them a breather so that they can develop skills. It might take them a long time. And start to establish a support network for when you're not around. Um, this pandemic really got my husband and I to hurry up and create our wills. Um, it, it scared us quite a lot. And so the person in charge of Joe's stuff will be a cousin who is of his generation. So she'll be around for a while. And if she needs help, you know, we've kind of set up a plan so that there are services from A&E that she can take advantage of because she works, she has a kid, she might have another kid. She may not have time to devote a ton of energy to Joe and she may need to access support from other places. Um, so where do you go from here? So don't compare your kids to neurotypical kids. I don't know if I've made this clear. I don't, maybe didn't mention this, but Kids with Asperger's and autism are often five to eight years behind neurotypical kids when it comes to, let's say, social and emotional and sometimes even cognitive maturity. So don't compare your neurodiverse kid to a neurotypical kid. Compare your neurodiverse kid's progress over time. So look at your goals for the future. Are those goals putting too much pressure on your kid? Is it like um, trying to get Cindy to get a job when she really needed to deal with her eating disorder. Are you in conflict with your kids' goals? Maybe you have the same goals, but they're not at the same priority. Align the goals. Rethink your notion of time. Now, I use this glacier picture in the middle, but that big blue snowy thing is, is a glacier. And I say to people in my support groups to be funny is think in terms of time, think like a geologist. Think in terms of glacial progress. And they all laugh. And it's good to laugh about it because it's not really funny, but um, humor gets me through. Don't just think about good as a destination, the quintessential American dream. Think about it as a cycle of change where you move forward at a glacial pace. Don't go it alone. There are parent coaches out there. That's something we do. Um, join a parent support group, join your CPAC. Um, don't go it alone. Talk to other parents. You're not, you don't have to be alone. So you can come to us. We have a ton of things for you. I'm not going to go through all of this, but I am going to point out we do have coaching for parents. So that's where we help you acquire skills um, to improve your parenting style, uh, maybe dynamics, or even prioritize the things that you want to work on first. We have a ton of support groups for parents. Um, 
we do college consultations. This is mostly for your kids, but it can be helpful to you as parents to help choose the right college. We have a boatload of educational information in the form of conferences and webinars and workshops. And we also have something called the LifeNet Independent Living Support Program, which is essentially a program for what to do with your kid when you're gone. And in all honesty, it currently is private pay and it's only in Massachusetts, New York and Connecticut. My dream someday is it's everywhere, but right now that's where it is. Um, but if you wanna find out more about it, you can. Here is all the things we do for adults. Three things to remember, trust. Trust is important because trust allows you to maintain some influence. Communicate with your kid like a peer coworker as much as you can. Avoid the power struggles and acknowledge your kid is doing a constant balancing juggling act to try to act neurotypical. And that takes a lot of energy and decide if they have enough energy left over to do whatever it is that you want them to do next. Rethink what good looks like. We talked about recalibrating your notion of time to think about glaciers. And if you can't change something, rethink about or reframe the way you think about it. And most importantly, you don't need to be a hero. Give yourself a break and realize you're doing the best you can. These are additional resources. Um, they will be in the PDF you get. You can click on them and you can look at them and listen to them. And I'm gonna stop sharing and turn this back. So thank you so much. Thank you, Michelle. Great, great content. Um, I, I, because we've run a little long, I just told the group that I'm gonna have them just contact you directly through the link that you shared in the presentation. We have been able to share that presentation. I've, I've got it on a shared drive right. now, so people, everyone has access to it. But um, lots of really positive comments. Your information is incredibly helpful. And I think with the, the follow-up questions that you're gonna get, it's gonna be diving into just some okay. unique um, situations for each of these parents. So, um, so what I will say is the connect to me thing was a way to make um, a phone appointment with me. So I probably don't have that many appointments on there. So send me an email, Michelle with one L, M-I-C-H-E-L-E -E, dot Kentara, C-A-N-T-A-R-A at aane.org. So the question about um, the support groups and we, we do have a creative writing work workshop as an interest group. Um, so there, the, when you see the link for adults for social activities, click on that and you can get to it. All right, and I'll share the link for the presentation one more time. And then thank you again, Michelle. And just to close it out, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna throw up a slide for just some things that we have coming up. Um, we have Microsoft coming out next week to talk about their, um, their hiring program. Even if you don't live in the Seattle area, I think this is a useful piece of information just so you can see what a good um, um, supportive employment program looks like. So that was one of the reasons why I asked them to come out. Um, we've had Temple Grandin out here twice to, to, give, to give great talks on, on the autistic brain. We've also had Rights Law come out to give two different talks on just how to advocate for our children. You can see those talks on our YouTube channel. And then we have a bunch of classes coming up in the future that I think might be um, very helpful for this audience. So check them out in our class catalog. And thank you again, Michelle. What, I learned so much. Um, I, I, I was writing all kinds of notes down for myself of things I'm going to do. So I really appreciate your time today and all the information.